as Dr. Marple said, the plumber. And uh, I will do that, and I'm glad to do it. Um, and so this talk is going to be on the ENT diagnosis and management of sleep disorder breathing. And so our, my objective really is to, for you guys to understand the anatomy and diseases of the upper airway that can cause sleep disorder breathing, understand the effects of primary medical and surgical treatment uh, of sleep disorder breathing, and understand the techniques to evaluate and treat failure of primary surgical or medical treatment of sleep disorder breathing. So to kind of understand what causes sleep disorder breathing, we have to understand what um, the airway looks like. When you look at the airway, you can have obstruction at any level, whether it's the nose and the inferior terminates uh, the septum, the nasopharynx uh, where the adenoids sit, the oral cavity where the tongue is, um, the oral pharynx where the tonsils are, the hypopharynx where the lingual tonsils are, which are on the back of the tongue, the larynx and the trachea. And you can have internal obstruction or external compression and the internal obstruction can be a firm lesion or a soft swelling. So there's lots of different ways uh, to treat depending on what the abnormality is. So we use clues to determine kind of where the level of obstruction is, and one of them is the noise. So when you have um, snoring uh, or stertorous type of breathing like you just heard, it's usually coming from the nose, nasal cavity, or, or the tonsil area. Um, and then even when they snore, you're going to have physical findings of like open mouth breathing and even you're trying to do a self jaw thrust to open up your airway to uh, decrease the obstruction in the back of the throat. So uh, those, a strider, it tells you a different location. So when you have that's usually somewhere in the larynx, but in the supraglottis above the vocal cords, if you have biphasic strider, that's usually at the level of the vocal cords or the subglottis, and expiratory wheeze would be in the trachea. We use a lot of clues to determine where the abnormality is, and so, so certainly the sound a child makes is one of those elements. The age plays a factor in what's causing the obstruction as well, whether you're infant, toddler, or preteen. Um, the craniofacial structure uh, and, and syndromes that we've already talked about, Dr. Mark Bull showed that slide. If you have neuromuscular issues um, and tonicity problems, that's going to cause more obstruction and certainly obesity. So some of that's been covered. When you look at anatomy in general, it's going to change over time. So for infants, you have uh, uh, obligate nasal breathers because the palate overlaps the epiglottis shown right in here. Um, versus an adult where there's an open airway. So, it, so sounds are going to sound different in an infant, and even an, a strider type sound can sound like a nasal uh, congestion sound be, just because of the airway. So you have to just know the anatomy to determine what abnormalities are going to be there. Um, and so we're going to look at kind of different levels of obstruction because it's not just all tonsils and adenoids, especially in infants. And when Dr. Mockbull showed um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations, they, they uh, take out infants in their whole equation because it's a totally different ballgame. So we're going to look at those. And when you look at obstruction uh, in the nasal cavity, you have to know what the nasal cavity normally looks like. So this is uh, a nasal cavity, a left side nasal cavity, nasal endoscopy in a six-week-old. So you have the septum, middle terminate, inferior terminate. It's kind of in the midsection. As you move more posterior, you still have the septum, middle terminate, inferior terminate. And then uh, as you go back, you start seeing the coena. And then you see it fully here with the adenoids, um, the torus tuberus, and the open and tedious station tube. So that's kind of what it looks like. Normally, the adenoids and tonsils when you're born are small. And so when you're an infant, there's common things that we see, so we look for those. And when you have obstructive or sleep disordered breathing, this is um, a nasal lacrimal duct cyst. So the, the nasal lacrimal system doesn't recanalize, it, uh, and it just forms this cyst that then fills this whole area with um, fluid and you have an obstruction in the medial canthal area because that's where the nasal lacrimal um, system is, nasal lacrimal duct gland. Uh, you can also have tumors. This is a glioma down here uh, and a encephalocele in the nasal cavity. And then over there at the, uh, the last picture is coronal atresia. So you can see, again, it's similar to this picture um, where you have to see that it's a flip 90 degrees, but I um, mean 180 degrees, but you see um, 
the septum, inferior turbinate, and middle turbinate, but there's complete obstruction. When you have obstruction is in the oral cavities, if it's usually related to the tongue. So this picture far left is a child with Beckwith-Wiedermann syndrome. He's got a big tongue. Um, kids with Down syndrome can have big tongues. And it's usually related to the tongue in the oral cavity. Uh, a child with retinopathy is gonna have a recessed chin, and, the, the, and so the jaw is re recessed. Um, the tongue is attached to the jaw, so then it's more posterior uh, and obstructing the airway. And then the larynx, there's all kinds of things as well that we have to think about. This here is um, laryngomalacia, have omega-shaped epiglottis, uh, AE folds that are tight, and arytenoids uh, that are still blocking the airway. So we, we just release these AE folds, and then you can see the vocal cords. Um, you can have sublaxic stenosis, you can see vocal cords, and uh, an opening there that's stenotic. This is sten stenosis under the cords. This is a laryngeal web with a small opening there, the vocal cords did not form. You can have subglottic hemangiomas, papillomas, um, and then you can have normal things that cause obstruction, uh, like reflux. So this is a flexible scope. Look in uh, directly at the larynx. You can see the vocal cords moving. It's red. You can see all the secretions. Um, and that, all that swelling can cause obstruction similar to this picture where it's another flexible scope looking this is the left side of the nose septum on the left inferior turbinate superior tur uh, middle turbinate this is the nasopharynx you can see the torus tuberis again um, you can see the opening to the nasopharynx lots of secretions and swelling moving back there's um, going down this is kind of what we see a lot intermittent visualization um, swelling in the uh, the larynx, and you can see if the right side, uh, the right trabeal cord is on the left side of the picture, and you can see that one moving pretty well. The left one's not moving at all. So uh, vocal cord paralysis, all these different lesions, including tracheal lesions. This is um, a normal trachea. You have a 270 degrees cartilaginous ring, membranous trachea in posteriorly, tracheomalacia, which is the, a common reason to have um, narrowing or obstruction in an infant. Uh, the membranous tracheal uh, area is enlarged, the cartilage is flattened. You can have external compression, that's an inanimate artery compression down here where the trachea is now narrowed. Or you can be born with a narrow trachea and complete tracheal rings. And um, when that happens, it's a tight little area, there's no membranous trachea, you have to actually repair it. You split the trachea in the middle um, and then do what's called a slide tracheoplasty by incising the posterior and anterior area. So this is plumbing. When you get older, so that's why they excluded infants. It's a lot of different uh, problems and you can't really make a guideline <clears throat> when you include all these disease patho uh, the, these pathological conditions when most of the time it's related to tonsils and adenoids. So when you look at children who are really two to 18, the most common reason to have obstructive breathing is large tonsils and adenoids. Um, you can have other lesions as well, but this is what we focus on because that's the main problem. In, in, when you're born, your tonsils and adenoids are small, like we showed. And as you grow, um, they grow with you. They're helping you. They're part of your immune system. And so that's when they enlarge. They usually peak in size around five to seven years of age and then shrink by the time you're a preteen or teenager um, because they're immunological <clears throat> components. And then uh, as a teenager, you have to think of another uh, condition as well. You can still have large tonsils and adenoids, but polyps become more of an issue, uh, whether they're abnormal po routine polyps that we see an allergic rhinitis or cystic fibrosis. This, the uh, child to the left, this adolescent, has allergic fungal sinusitis. You can see his, on a CT, his uh, nose is completely obstructed with polyps that are shown in the endoscopic picture. He's even got a craniofacial defect with his eye pushed laterally. On the bottom left um, is an antral coinal polyp. So it's a polyp that starts from the maxillary antrum, goes down to the posterior nasal cavity, ends up in the uh, back of the throat um, and pushing on the palate and completely blocking the oral pharynx. Um, and then you can have turbinate hypertrophy or septal deflection. So we have to think about all these different things when we see a child with sleep disorder breathing because um, it's not always tonsils and adenoids. But sleep disorder breathing, as Dr. Markbull said, is a, is a problem. There's 74 million children in the United States currently. As many as 10%, 6 to 12%, according to Dr. Markbull, have primary snoring, which is a lot. Um, and most of our literature says the prevalence of OSA is about one to four percent. I think Dr. Mark Bull said 
four to six, but it's still it's a problem, so it's millions of kids. Um, <clears throat> and when you have sleep disorder breathing, you're going to have a problem. So these kids have um, behavioral problems, enuresis, hyperactivity, aggression, anxiety, depression, somatization that actually improves when you improve the sleep disorder breathing. So that's the goal. Um, and their quality of life is affected significantly. Um, it's like having a chronic disease uh, like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or asthma when you look um, with, when they do surveys. So it's a big problem. And so a lot of people have written on it. <clears throat> There's 35,000 um, publications on sleep disorder breathing over the last 40 years. And then 14,000 on tonsil and 12,000 uh, on obstructive sleep apnea. <clears throat> so that's why it's good that Dr. Mockbull went over the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines because you need people who are going to get together in a room. It's usually a group of different people, all um, shareholders, stakeholders in a disease process, so it's pediatricians, sleep medicine doctors. I don't know about orthodontists and dentists if they're in the room, ENTs, um, lots of different people, hopefully they are, um, <clears throat> to look at what's the problem and how do you come up with a solution. First, you have to review the literature. And so um, they do that, and for, for as Dr. Mockbull said, um, for this um, guideline, um, they looked, I don't know if he said, they looked at over 3,000 um, articles and, and really focused on 350 of them. And he really went over all the guidelines, um, which is good because that's kind of how we decide what to do. Um, it, I think it's critical to say they are guidelines, and sometimes insurance companies try to pick them up and use them as gospel, and we really have to push back. And most of the people I know that do these guidelines really know this and put this in the literature when they produce a guideline and say, you know what, this is not exact science. It's a, there's an art of medicine. Every child's individual, and you've got to treat that child like that. So um, I am thankful for that, but, but they did just focus in this guideline <clears throat> on the healthy child or maybe the obese healthy child and had to eliminate all, the chi all other children with the disease, whether you had central apnea, you were young, um, or you had all these other medical conditions like Down syndrome, craniofacial anomalies, neuromuscular diseases, because the literature is just too vast. You can't really focus in on, a, on a one subset of people, uh, uh, children. And this is what Dr. Michael went over. So the last thing on that list was medical therapy. And for, in 2012, they said that you can use um, steroids for uh, sleep disorder breathing. But, and some of this other literature was out, like using antibiotics, because sometimes you see these kids, they have big tonsils and adenoids, parents are scared, they're obstructive breathing, they think their child's gonna die, they haven't gone to see a specialist yet, um, or somebody who can potentially do something to fix it. And so putting them on a round of antibiotics and maybe oral steroids, there wasn't any information out there. I've done that before with parents who don't really want surgery at this point. And it does help. When you're on antibiotics, there are studies that show it decreases your um, symptoms of sleep disorder breathing and decreases your AHI. But you can't be on antibiotics forever. I mean, we've already created resist resistant bacteria in the 90s when we treated um, colds like that. So, but there are some studies that show um, month-long trials of antibiotics have worked. Um, like I said, oral steroids and histamines, I don't know if there's any information. There's 35,000 um, papers, so I could have missed it. Um, <laughs> Glucotriene blockers. Um, this really information has come out since the guidelines in, in 2012. Over the last six to eight years, there's been a lot of studies on singular monoleucast that really show it's beneficial. So whether you use it before or after your surgical intervention, if it's tonsils and adenoids, and really, like it shows decreasing the AHI, um, down to four, which is still abnormal, but better. Uh, and it depends on where you start with your HI, but it's used in mild to moderate OSA. And then steroids, again, this was in that uh, IKEA key action statement in the American Academy of Pediatrics from, two, uh, from 2012, but not all steroids are the same. Now, the effectiveness may be pretty similar. If you look at these steroids, budesonide or rhinocort, flonase or fluticasone, mometasone, um, Nasonex, flunisonide, and beclomethasone all have been studied, and they all show there's benefit in mild sleep disorder breathing and mild sleep apnea. Um, and, and doing lots of things, improving the nasal obstruction, improving snoring, total nasal symptoms, adenoid size, quality of life, lower the AHI, so they are beneficial. But they're really not all the same, so their, their safety profiles are different. If you look at the percentage next to the steroid, that's the percentage of absorption to the body. So for rhinocort, 11%, some studies say 20, 
Flonase, 1 to 2 percent, uh, Nasonex, 0.5 to 1 percent, and these older ones are 40 to 50 percent. So does that mean anything? If you get absorbed into the body, does that cause any problems? Because when you spray a, a topical nasal steroid spray into your nose, only 30 to 40 percent gets absorbed into the nasal cavity. And then hopefully it, it's active there, but then it can go into the bloodstream from there. The other half gets swallowed, and then it goes through your GI tract into your liver, liver and it depends on how well, well your liver breaks it down as to how much is getting absorbed into the body. But, but both of those pathways end up to, to the bloodstream, so then these studies have measured um, the bloodstream to find out is there an issue. So for this, this uh, Dr. Schoner, who's a pediatric allergist and endocrinologist, he did a study back in 2000 with beclomethasone, which is one of the older ones, which has the absorption of 40, of 40 to 50 percent bioavailability in the bloodstream. And what he found is when it was bioavailable, it was bioactive, meaning it caused a problem. And these, these are kids <clears throat> who were, whose height were evaluated through standing stadiometry. So if they did it, if they used the medicine every day for a year, they were shorter one centimeter. Um, so that's where the, bat, the steroids, nasal steroids get a bad rap, and so the FDA has gone I, uh, and, and put labels on lots of the different steroids, and some of them are a little bit safer. So when it was bioavailable, it was bioactive. Now they did so that Flonase, or GlaxoSmithKline, who owned Flonase, did the study. Um, to look at the bioavailability and bioactivity. So bioavailability was only one to two percent. So bioactivity, it wasn't bioactive. So this is the same kind of study where they uh, measure height for a year. The kids are on it every day for a year and there's no difference in placebo. Nasonex did the same study and it's safe too. So when it's not bioavailable, it's usually not bioactive. Now none of the topical nasal steroids really cause trouble with the hypothalamic pituitary axis syndrome or hormones. So you don't have to worry about that, but it does cause trouble with the growth. So how do they work? We don't know. Um, they do block chemical mediators in the nose. We know that from the allergic rhinitis studies. There is an increase in expression of the glutocorticoid receptors in, the, in lymphoid tissue. So maybe the lymphoid tissue is growing. It has these receptors. So if you use the medicine when they're growing, it'll shrink them. And studies do show when you spray the uh, topical nasal steroid spray, it will shrink the adenoids and it will decrease your sleep disorder breathing. So once you've got, uh, finished medical therapy, then or move on to surgical therapy, which is the number one recommendation for treatment in a child with adenotonsil hypertrophy is to take out the tonsils and adenoids. And so Dr. Mockbull touched on this as well. And when, we, when our group searched the literature, um, it did show that it was successful in 60 to 90 percent of the time if children don't have anything else going on except maybe they're overweight or have uh, uh, other obesity. Um, and really, when you look at the studies, the 90%, if you have a child who um, is not obese um, and is Caucasian, uh, those kids actually get better 90% of the time when you take the tonsils and adenoids out when the tonsils and adenoids are enlarged. Um, but regardless of um, whether, they, whether they improve dramatically, which is a success, which is defined as the AHI less than one, that's what we're looking for, most everybody, when you take the tonsils and out, adenoids out, improve. <clears throat> so you could take a severe case of OSA and maybe make it a mild case of OSA, which would still be a failure in the studies, but then you could treat the mild OSA with, a, with medical therapy or other um, or different therapies. And so this is just more information about kind of who failed the CHAT study. Um, is a childhood adenotonsillar uh, hypertrophy study that was an interinstitutional study that actually um, had a control group. So you, they took over 400 kids and they randomized them to either TNA or watchful waiting if they actually um, met the criteria to remove the tonsils. And the, the children who had their tonsils removed did better than the kids who didn't. And then the, the group crossed over um, at seven months, which is the waiting period. And so in children who failed that study, and the success rate was 80%, um, were obese. And that's kind of where the 60% comes in. Certain ethnicities, like African Americans, don't do quite as well with TNA, and, and that may be tonicity problems. We don't, I don't know if that's been elucidated. And those certainly who are worse, who have AHI greater than um, five. It's children with asthma and older children and children with craniofacial syndromes have shown to quote unquote fail TNA, which means your AHI doesn't go to one. So this is what we do in the majority of cases here. So this is. A curved alice, it's an instrument, and we're grabbing, this is the left tonsil. Um, 
This is an instrument called cold blader, and uh, it has a positive negative charge at the tip, and saline is introduced uh, in through it to, electri uh, to uh, uh, carry the charge, and then it, it dissects the tissue by breaking the bonds with the heat and energy. Um, we, we pull out the tonsil, we look for the curve of the tonsil and look for um, the bulge to determine where the plane is. We start dissecting after we incise the anterior tonsillar pillar, and then you can kind of see a plane. It looks um, grayish uh, compared to the tonsil, which looks yellow. And so we use that and start dissecting with whatever instrument you're going to use. There's lots of different instruments to take the tonsils and that one's out with. Um, this one is half the heat of standard technique, which is cautery. Um, and it also has a cautery on the tip of it, so if you start bleeding during the case, you can control that. This is in the surgical position, so it's upside down. This is the uh, retrovert catheter that's lifting the palate up. This is the uvula. This is the tongue we press and compress with the mouth gag, so sometimes kids can have some um, discomfort following that on their tongue. Um, this is me trying to get that last little bit, and then finally got it, and then suction out the fluid so again, we have guidelines, and these were first produced in 2011, and now we're redoing them at the American Academy of Otolaryngology in 2018. And we've looked at that same literature, the American Academy of Pediatrics, plus a little bit more. And we really just focused on tonsillectomy, not just sleep disorder breathing, and the reasons for tonsillectomy. So this, this uh, guideline encompasses um, recurrent tonsillitis, which we won't go over, and then sleep disorder breathing and how we decide what to do. And so these are basically our, the recommendations that have come out of that. Th this is actually a handout they recommend us giving uh, in this wording to our patients on sleep disorder breathing. So enlarged tonsils is the most common reason that children develop obstructive sleep disorder breathing. And we've established that. Both tonsil size and muscular tone play a role in sleep disorder breathing. That seems like that's established as well. Um, obesity plays a major role in sleep disorder breathing, yes. Uh, Polysomnography is the best test to confirm that a child has OSA and provides baseline information, yes. Um, polysomnography is not necessary in all cases, and access may be limited by availability of sleep laboratories and w uh, willingness of insurance and third-party payers to cover the cost of testing. So Dr. Mockbull went over that a little bit, too. Um, and some of that, you know, I guess ideally everybody would get a sleep study if it was free and available, but that's not always the case. Um, so. Uh, when, when this committee looked at all the data for an otherwise healthy child with a strong history of struggling to breathe with daytime symptoms and enlarged tonsils, the polysomnography is not performed. Because based on all the studies, when this sunk, in this middle one, a younger, normal weight, non-African American child has a success rate close to 90%. So do you really need to do another test to determine that if you can see, if you have that type of child and big tonsils and adenoids and they have the signs of sleep disorder breathing, can you just proceed to TNA? And I would say yes. Um, but the success of tonsillectomy is variable. The age, weight, ethnicity, uh, OSA severity, and associated, with medical and associated medical conditions affect the success, just like we've gone over. Obese children, again, uh, same that we've talked about. Now, we, we shared um, decision making is a big deal that I've always done, but now it's a big deal for our academy, is to really talk to the parents about what do we do? So caregivers need to be aware that the child may require additional interventions to cure his or her sleep disorder breathing, which can vary from weight loss and obese kids, medications like we've talked about, um, or wearing a special mask while sleeping that will keep the airway open. So CPAP or some other kind of positive pressure. And then some children may be candidates for more advanced sleep surgery procedures and th those kids who fail um, TNA. Um, tonsillar function, we kind of talked about that. Uh, they work like lymph nodes creating antibodies. So they're part of your immune system, which is why they hypertrophy, we think, um, as you get older. So are you doing harm by taking them out? Um, this has been studied some over the last 30 years, um, and most of the studies say no, uh, that you're not doing any harm. Um, they have looked at the immunological factors when you take the tonsils out. And there's a little dip in uh, the immunological factors that come back after a month so that the immunity is the same. Um, but there's no significant studies to date, up until probably June of this year, that demonstrate a significant clinical impact of the a tonsillectomy on the immune system. There are like eight or 10 studies or more that show when the tonsils are chronically infected, they don't work anymore anyway. They're not working uh, to help you fight um, uh, pathogens that come in through the immunity. So we think certainly in chronic tonsillitis, uh, 
they're, they're a, they've turned from good to bad already. So you can take them out. And you know, part of the deal is too, there's 300 lymph nodes in the back of the nose and neck that do the exact same job as the tonsils and adenoids. So once you take them out, there's a backup plan. But they're there for a reason, so you think they're important, so you don't just want to take them out willy-nilly. Now the one, um, there, there is one study that came out that people should know about from um, Denmark that, had, that looked at 1.2 million people over the last 30 years and uh, 1.2 million children <clears throat> and, and tried to see dust tonsils, removing the tonsils and adenoids when you're um, five to nine years of age cause trouble later in life. And so epidemiologically, there were like 55,000 kids that had their tonsils, adenoids, or tonsils, adenoids together out. And they felt like that group, when they looked at all the data, and this is historical data looking at, um, not looking at everything, it's looking at um, codes in their system and trying to match all that up. They, they, they basically produced a paper that said they think there's a two to three fold increased risk of respiratory illness if you take the tonsils and adenoids out when you're a, uh, f five to 10, two to three fold, um, and you're now 10, 20, 30 years of age. Um, the, the methodology was poor. I thought I really don't hold much weight, especially if you're trying to, to look at risk-benefit ratio. If you have a child who's got obstructive breathing, they're not you know, sleeping at night, they're not doing well in school, they're not growing because it affects your growth, risk that versus maybe some increased risk when they're 30. I mean, you certainly have to know about it and think about it, but I really don't, I, I think it was a poor study and there's uh, nothing else out, but that was just the first one this summer, so who knows. Um, why did the tonsils and adenoids get big in the first place? We've kind of talked about that. They're helping your immune system mature and there's immunological factors that show that as well as studies that look at bacteria and viruses in the tonsil and they find it. So, so if there's bacteria and viruses in the tonsil, they're probably doing something to help your immune system mature and they're like little factories, so they're, they're getting bigger. So. Um, once you take the tonsils and adenoids out, if they do, if they're fine, great, you're done, right? Um, they can move on. If they're still having issues, then you have to decide what else do you do. do uh, if they're still having some mild snoring, maybe you treat with medical therapy. If they're um, worse than that and you're worried about them, a lot of times what we do is we flexibly scope them in the clinic and just look at the upper airway. We see if there's any regrowth of the adenoids or what the tonsils look like. I can look at the lingual tonsils and see if there's hypertrophy of them in the office setting. You can't get an idea of collapse in the office setting because they're awake and Dr. Mockbull showed it's different when you're uh, awake and asleep. Um, so there's a couple of different new things that have come out over the last probably five to ten years. Uh, drug-induced sleep endoscopy and using the CINE MRI scan. So drug-induced sleep endoscopy is taking them to the operating room, giving them medication uh, that mimics sleep, and then put a flexible scope in the nose and see where it's collapsed um, while they're spontaneously breathing. We, and spontaneously breathing has been a big deal for ENT for like 10 to 20 years. It just helps us do our procedures better than an than apneic technique anyway. So um, people have gotten better about knowing how to do that. And, and, you, and this will identify some lesions um, that you may not see when they're awake. You can get some of that same information by doing an MRI scan where you put them in a sleep state with medication uh, and then um, you do the MRI and see where they obstruct. Uh, Are you doing any of those? I'm not doing any of those. Um, I think Craig Brown can do those. Yeah. So actually, they published the paper, <laughs> Mitchell and those, the anesthesiologists, and they're and they're doing a drug-induced sleep endoscopy too. Usually, those kids have, are more complicated. They have craniofacial syndromes. There's other things going on, and so um, they're a select population that end up getting that uh, procedure. But when you do the procedure, this is what you find: the problems after tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy are normally lingual tonsils. Um, uh, hypertrophy, and removing the, I've removed uh, several sets of lingual tonsils, well, it's one set, it's one lingual tonsil, um, and that has resolved obstructive apnea even based on a sleep study. Um, superglottis, uh, we're finding now over the last five or ten years that there can be a second stage of laryngomalacia where in the preteen and teenage years it's, it becomes floppier and you can do superglottoplasty on those kids and they get better. You can have uh, pharyngeal or palate abnormalities and floppiness. Floppiness is tough to treat. Um, sur with surgery, CPAP is better. Um, sometimes if the palate, you can shorten it a little bit, but not like in adults. With kids, it's, it's not quite as successful. Your inferior turbinates and septum can be enlarged and deflected, so you have to look at that. So these are the main reasons 
people fail um, tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy when you look at that. So this is kind of just a broad range of information on this disorder. So that's it. Any questions about that?